Good morning. My name is uh, Katrin Ganswind. I'm a finance campaigner, and with me is my colleague Niels Bart, head of oil and gas research at Urgewald. Urgewald is an environmental and human rights organization based in Germany. We already established the global coal exit list in 2017, and we already mentioned, uh, managed to influence assets under management of over 16 trillion US dollar with our global coal exit list. Today we want to introduce to you our newest data project, the Global Oil and Gas Exit List. Financial institutions are in a unique position to help or hurt the climate. In the last two years, we have seen a surge of new coal policies, but hardly anything substantial on oil and gas. And one reason for that is that financial institutions who want to walk away from fossil fuels face a major problem, which is lack of information. And this is where the goggle comes in. With the global oil and gas exit list, we want to enable financial institutions to, have, uh, to make impactful climate policies on oil and gas. Our global oil and gas exit list uh, lists 878 companies that are either producing oil and gas assets, are expanding their production, or which are building new fossil fuel interest infrastructure like pipelines and LNG terminals. And my colleague Niels Barge will now tell you a few details on the list. Yeah, so firstly, I'd like to talk um, a bit about the sources that we use. So um, the most important source, um, as on the coal side of our research at Urgewald, are company-based data sources. So those include annual reports, financial statements, investor presentations, or sustainability reporting documents. Um, on the oil and gas side, we have um, we work with a third-party data provider on the upstream side to be able to provide extremely precise information on, on upstream-related metrics. Um, connected to production, uh, short-term expansion, and exploration um, of fossil fuels. Um, that uh, data provider is Rice at Energy. It's, it's Norwegian-based and uh, quite renowned in the field. In addition to that, um, we work with government agencies or information provided by government agencies as well as NGO partners like uh, Global Energy Monitor who provide us with information on the midstream side, so about pipeline developments as well as LNG terminal developments. Our list includes um, a, a wide variety of data, um, of data and um, that includes information about hydrocarbons production, so um, that includes oil, gas, natural gas liquids and condensate production, but it also includes information about production percentages when it comes to unconventionals. So how much of the overall production of an oil and gas company has um, been extracted through fracking, for example? That is something that you can look up um, on Google. Um, other data points connected to unconventionals include tar, include tar sands, um, coal bed methane, extra heavy oil, as well as ultra deep water and Arctic production. Um, in addition to that, I've already briefly mentioned our expansion metrics. So we do have two exploration metrics on the up upstream side that include short-term expansion and exploration capex. And we also do a revenue analysis and a reputational risk project analysis um, on Goggle. And what that is um, is something that you'll find out in a second. So first, I'd like to talk about two different uh, kinds of unconventionals. Um, that are part of the global oil and gas exit list, um, and one. Uh, of them is fracking. So key issues with fracking are um, its greenhouse gas intensity because more wellheads mean um, more oil and gas infrastructure which leads to more leakages. And in terms of gas, we're talking methane leakages here. So the impact, the climate impact is quite severe. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's uh, the risk of groundwater pollution and an increasing risk of earthquakes that we can see um, in, in a lot of the areas where um, fracking takes place, for example, in Vaca Muerte in Argentina or uh, in Oklahoma in the U.S. Another unconventional category in our list is the Arctic category, which is a geographical analysis of oil and gas production. So all of these data points are ascribed to certain companies. So, so on Google, you can find out which company produces what amount of oil and gas in the Arctic. Um, key issues in the Arctic are um, obviously um, the risk of 
oil and gas spills um, if exploration and production takes place offshore. Um, but also onshore, oil and gas extraction in the Arctic has severe consequences. Um, for example, due to black carbon emissions um, that uh, increase, um, base, that, that decrease the I'm sorry, uh, decrease the um, solar irradiance that is reflected from the Earth's sur surface, but also um, because, um, for example, pipeline maintenance um, is a lot more important um, because of thawing permafrost soil. So other metrics on the upstream side include our um, expansion metrics, and those are especially important. So short-term expansion means um, that companies are planning to move assets and resources entailed in these assets into the production stage. So that means they're planning to add untapped new resources to their production portfolio. And we put numbers on those activities so that you and everyone else using our database can actually see what amount of oil and gas is going to be put into production in the near future. So if I say, when I say, whenever I say in the near future, I mean a time period of about one to seven years. Um, in addition to that, we have exploration capex information that complements our short-term expansion data. Uh, so that means um, we're putting numbers on exploration activities and in, in it's measured in U.S. dollars in order for our users to find out how much money is actually put towards um, exploration. Now, in addition to that, we do also have um, expansion metrics on the midstream side. We have LNG terminals under development that we measure in, in million tons of annual processing capacity. And we also have a data set on pipelines under development so that users can actually see um, what midstream companies expand. In, in what way midstream companies expand. Um, and that is very important to understand because um, it often leads to more extraction on the upstream side. In, ad in addition to that, as I've already briefly mentioned, we um, have a, re a revenue analysis um, that we do for all of the companies on our list. Um, so I think it's important to understand that the, the companies on our list are, almost all of them are entirely working on oil and gas. So only 12 companies on, ups, on our upstream list have a fossil fuel share of revenue below 50%. And 75% uh, and of the companies on, on Goggle have a fossil fuel share of revenue of over 90%. And that number is likely even higher because um, for quite a few companies on the list, and for the information sources are not sufficient to come up with revenue numbers. Um, and uh, that tells us that business models are rarely diversified beyond oil and gas when it comes to the companies on our, on our list. And it also means that most companies are either solely focused on oil and gas extraction or on other business activities um, in the oil and gas value chain. Well, the, the last thing I want to talk about are the reputational risk projects, and uh, we really hope those will uh, come in handy uh, not only for financial institutions, but also for journalists and um, for um, NGOs around the world, but also um, for, for academics. So these um, projects, um, they go, I mean, a lot of oil and gas projects go in hand with severe environmental destruction, or um, a lot of these projects have... Um, a great potential for conflict and violence, or social, social harm, for example. And all of these categories are ascribed to certain projects, which are then ascribed to the companies on our list, so that users can identify the risks, the reputational risks entailed in these projects, and um, so that campaigners and journalists can read up on the projects, get, get informed, see all of our sources, um, and uh, yeah, basically build up a narrative uh, around these projects. Um, yeah, and that's it from my side. After Niels filled you in with what does the goggle actually contain, I want to elaborate a bit more on why do we need the goggle. And as all of you are here on the climate conference probably know, is that we are about to lose the battle against climate change. And one industry which carries a major responsibility for that is the fossil fuel sector, oil and gas, and of course also coal. If the oil and gas sector would go on with business as usual, runaway climate change would be inevitable. You can see that on this graph on the red line. But even if all resources already developed would just be used up and no new ones would be found, we would still not be able to 
limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And this is why many NGOs and other organizations are saying since decades that we need to phase out fossil fuels and the voices are getting louder on we need to stop the expansion of fossil fuels. And all the groups and NGOs have like a very uh, famous advocate on that uh, since this summer when the IEA Net Zero 2050 report came out. So the IEA, which was always known for backing the fossil fuel industry, now pro proclaims there can be no new investments in oil, gas and coal from now, from this year. But the oil and gas industry is still in denial. As we can see on our oil and gas list, oil and gas producers, at least 96% of them, are planning to expand their operations. And as Neil said, we can now put a number to that. Looking at the short-term expansion, so those assets which will be under production in the next years, what, about 190 billion barrels of oil equivalent are currently developed in the short term. This will lead to additional 95 gigatons of CO2 equivalents that are going to be released into the atmosphere. If we're looking on the long run, it doesn't look much better. If we look at capital expenditure on exploration activities in the last three years, companies spent 168 billion US dollars on exploration for these fossil assets. And just to put it into a pers one perspective, if you look at the Green Climate Fund, just one year, 2020, 2.1 billion US dollars were put into that. So even if you, if you multiply this with three, it's not even a tiny fraction on what was spent on the fossil fuel industry. Of course, we can also give you numbers on the midstream expansion. So, for example, if you look at all the pipelines which are currently in the works and you would just put them behind each other, they could reach five times, more than five times around the Earth with more than 200,000 kilometers. If you look at LNG terminals, we can say oil and gas companies want to double down on worldwide LNG terminal capacity over 1,200 million tons of production capacity annually are in the works and some of the major companies you can see displayed here. So what we want to achieve with our list is that financial institutions exclude the big, the dirty and the dangerous. The big are the companies at the forefront of upstream expansion. So those companies with the biggest expansion plans, with the biggest share of unconventional expansion, or those which are expanding in frontier countries, so those where the oil and gas industry is not established yet, and dependency is still to come. Also, the dirty, so those companies with substantial unconventional production, so as my colleague explained, um, with severe environmental impact like fracking, ultra-deep drilling, or in pristine natural areas like in the Arctic or uh, in the rainforest. And third, the dangerous. So those companies which are responsible for the development of infrastructure which will lock us in into a fossil path future. Pipelines and LNG terminals, right? The oil and gas exit list is meant to enable financial institutions to stop the expansion of the fossil fuel industry and manage a decline and phase out of the fossil fuel industry. I said in the beginning there is not much policies out there but in fact since the oil and gas exit list was already um, uh, distributed um, to colleagues in the last weeks, we already saw a first few oil and gas policies emerging, namely Credit Mutuel, La Banque Postale and the Insurer Maif, all from France, 
will exclude oil and gas companies that are expanding on the basis of our global oil and gas exit list. This is just the beginning, and I hope you're going to spread the word so more institutions will follow. Thank you, and we're looking forward to your questions. Uh, yeah. Hello, Andrea Rizzi, Italian Media. I wonder to what extent um, during your research um, carbon capture came up, whether companies are planning to kind of put that in the, their business models to, uh, for example, exhausted wells or to use it for CCS since many countries now are uh, planning to kind of offset their emissions through CCS and using exhausted gas or oil fields. Yeah. So. That pops up from time to time. We see that when we um, yeah, browse their reporting documents and on especially their sustainability reporting documents because that is usually um, where they advertise such projects, right? Um, however, the, the problem with, with a lot of these projects is that they will never be able to capture a sufficient amount of scope three emissions that are uh, caused by oil and gas combustion. So it's always just a tiny little bit, um, yeah. It's, 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 it doesn't have um, enough impact to counteract what oil and gas um, extraction and uh, eventually oil and gas combustion does to our climate. So while I think it's good that um, a bit of that happens, it, it can't be um, scaled up in a way that is actually able to help or to, to solve the problem. The problem can only be solved by, by a managed decline of production. And um, yeah, we, we hope to get there with, with the help of our list and obviously also a lot of uh, NGO colleagues around the world and not only NGO, NGO colleagues, obviously. Do you feel that they're kind of selling it as something bigger than it actually is? Oh, definitely. That's why I was talking about like their sustainability doc, um, reporting documents, because that is usually where um, they will tell a story of their future green kind of business. And a lot of these companies, um, for example, they, they report their renewable energy um, activities together with their gas segment as some kind of new energy business, which gas is definitely not, um, right? So, so it is a very clever way of framing certain activities and um, putting them into a green perspective um, or into a green yeah, frame, basically, although um, a lot of those activities are not really able to, to solve the problem at all. Um, there are um, also other things that are put out, for example, lar large afforestation efforts um, put out by some uh, companies, um, but also these efforts, I mean, while it's good that that takes place, it does not solve the problem at all, um, not at all. It's just, um, yeah, it's basically a advertising and, uh, yeah, I think you could call it greenwashing. Um, I'm Fran Witt from Recourse. Um, if, I think this is a fantastic initiative. Um, I'm wondering to what extent you've considered how this list might be used to influence public finance as well as private finance. Um, obviously, we've seen significant commitment from the World Bank and other multilateral development banks to the expansion of gas, um, and that obviously needs to be rolled back, and I think this is a useful tool. Yeah, I mean, definitely this can be, the list can be used for any kind of financial institutions because um, financial support to companies expanding um, can be spotted with this list from NGOs to, to campaigns as well as from financial institutions of any kind to clean their portfolios of oil and gas. This can be insurance companies, this can be multilateral banks or private investors. Um, all kinds of financial institutions can use it and of course NGOs can use it for their campaigns especially as we have the reputation risk projects which give like a face to the investments. Yeah, we want to create transparency on oil and gas, on the oil and gas sector and oil and gas extraction and future extraction um, and um, with that transparency we want to create a foundation, a data foundation on the basis of which um, 
yeah, actions such as policies and financial institutions um, can go forward, but also campaigns, for example, or articles by, by journalists, for example. We want to enable all of those different things by yeah, basically creating a new uh, way of transparency around oil and gas. So if there are no further questions, I think we're good. Um, you always have the opportunity to talk to us after uh, the presentation as well. We'll be around and we're happy to talk to you.